But I'll tell you a little story. Um, I, I've worked in Hollywood now for 25 years, the only job I ever had. It, um, it actually really was my first job. And I started, I was, 20, um, I was 24, and at the time I was a film student, so we're in a film school, this is a perfect beginning. Uh, and I was a film student at UCLA in the School of um, Screenwriting, the School of Film, Theater, and Television, I was in the screenwriting. And um, every few weeks we would have to present the pages we had written on well, the screenplay we were working, and we'd sort of sit around a table. And um, it's surprising, really, because you'd think that people in, in Los Angeles studying film wouldn't be um, um, horribly pompous and pretentious. You'd think that they would be, at least they're, they're, they're it's like well, you're working in the town, the mill town, and it's the mill, it's the, the thing we create there. But they were. So I, I had my little script, and we were sort of reading it. And there's a, there's a small class, about 10 writers. And uh, one uh, young woman um, hated it, what I wrote, I'd written. And um, she was trying to come up with the best possible insult for it, I think. And so she said, she sort of pointed to it and said, this, this is really just television to me. Um, and I thought to myself, I didn't understand that was supposed to be an insult at the time. I thought, oh. Well, maybe I should do television. Uh, and the good news for television is that it's got more and more interesting. It, was, it, it started sort of as the as little stepson of, uh, of Hollywood screenwriting and movies, and then it got more and more interesting. And now uh, I think everyone realizes, no matter what, where you live, the most interesting work uh, in sort of film medium, the film medium is on television. Um, that's where everybody wants to be. That's where all my filmmaker friends want to be. That's what all the big directors want to be, because they can tell longer stories and t talk about character and do the kinds of things that people in the, in the, in the film business just don't do anymore. Um, so, so let me give you a little, little, a little background, a, a little statistic, which I think is sort of interesting. Um, when I started, I worked at Paramount Studios, and that was my first job. Drove in the Paramount gate, and they were making about 30 movies a year then. So they were releasing 30 movies a year. So they'd make, have uh, 15, 20 in production at any one time. They would go and buy movies that they saw later in a process called a negative pickup. They would buy the negative, or they would put money into a movie, or they would offer to distribute a picture. But basically, it was 30 a year. Uh, and this was 1990. Um, this year, they may, will, they may release seven pictures. Maybe nine if they um, buy some in the film festival or distribute one. So maybe it'll get to 10. Um, the sad thing about movies is that people in Hollywood don't make them anymore. The studios just don't make them. They'll make a big four or five big pictures a year uh, with the superhero, with the Avengers or Spider-Man or something like that, where, you know, where, in my opinion, all those movies seem the same. There's always one last moment where New York City explodes and the cab, someone's always getting out of a cab and there's always a woman with a, tro with a stroller looking up and, and while the creature kills it. Uh, but the smaller pictures, the ones that, for instance, on Monday we'll see a movie by Billy Wilder um, called One, Two, Three. That's, the, that's a Monday film event. It's going to be great. It's a great. If you haven't seen it, it's worth seeing. It's wonderful. If you don't know Billy Wilder, you should know Billy Wilder. And it's, a, it's a, based on a short story written by um, Frank Molnar, who wrote, um, I think his most famous contribution, Lilium. He wrote Lily, Lilium was made into a pit movie, and then it was made into another movie, and then it was made into a musical, Carousel. Um, with a happy ending, and there's a story there. Apparently, um, he he apparently was a very um, difficult writer. Uh, it's, if anybody's studying writing, I'm a writer, so I understand what that means to be a difficult writer. Very moody, uh, very angry. Didn't like anything changed. Um, but he sold the picture. He sold Lilium, the script, to to um, the musical, and he went and saw it. And it's it's not a happy ending at the end of the musical, but it's happier than. Being, I think he's in, the, in Lilium, he's dragged down to hell by demons. Um, in this one, he's, it's sort of happy. It's a, it's sort of a, it becomes a, a, a rousing number. It's, I think it's called uh, You'll Never Walk Alone, I think is the, the song. Uh, and so they showed it to him. I think they showed it to him in previews, meaning that the movie hadn't quite, the, the play had not opened yet. And, um, and they expected screams, rage, you know, what have you done? And instead, his response was, uh, Tears. He was crying. But this is so beautiful. You've uh, you've uh, you've made made my story so beautiful. So the truth is, Hollywood can corrupt anyone. That's the other thing. Um, but 
But I'll, I'll tell you another story, that this, that just to understand what the business is. When uh, uh, Sony, the big, uh, your, uh, big Japanese electronics giant, bought Columbia and TriStar uh, Studios, and Columbia Studios was one of the old ones, and TriStar was a rather recent one, but they came in and they bought Columbia and TriStar, um, and they bought the, it was an old, it's a beautiful movie lot too, the Col old Columbia lot, it's one of the beautiful movie studios around. Um, and they hired a very, very uh, prolific, successful producer, his name is Peter Goober. Uh, and he'd done the Batman movies, and he'd done a bunch of other big pictures, and done Rain Man, um, and they hired him to be the president of the studio. And so he's president of the studio, and they brought him to Tokyo for a big uh, worldwide executive conference. All the executives from Sony came. And uh, apparently it's this beautiful building in, uh, in, in Tokyo, and the, the meeting room is sort of like the, the UN, if designed by you know, a Japanese designer, and beautiful wood everywhere, very, you know, very Japanese. And everybody's got, you know, they're all from the world, from the world so they all have things in their ear, and there's a constant translation. And they asked him what his plan was. Now that he owned, now that they've given him the movie studio, it's his, he can make movies, what's his plan? And he said, here's my plan, my business plan. I'm gonna make 30 movies this year, 30 movies a year. Um, about 15 of them will do okay. They'll probably break even, be all right, they'll make their money back, they won't lose any money, but they'll be good, they'll be all right, and their, their future value will be in cable television and DVDs and rentals and, um, and television licensing and things like that. So that's half. Um, five of them are going to be uh, very cheap to make, uh, but they're going to be profitable, and so we'll hope to develop new talent without those five, and we'll hope to sort of uh, identify new directors and maybe a new writer, and you never know, maybe one of those five will be a, a success and we'll be able to make multiples. But he said five of those, five of the additional, so now we're at 25, um, are going to be solid, what we call, a, if you're in a baseball term, a solid double or triple. Um, it's going to make a lot of money, and it potentially could be, these could be movies that we could then make a sequel or part two to. And he said, and, 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 and he said uh, and, you know, maybe one or two of them is going to be an outright gigantic hit. It's going to be a huge hit. It's going to pay for everything. Uh, and that leaves three. Three are going to be disasters. Three will be bombs. Three will fail utterly um, and um, will be complete money losers. That's his business plan. And so a little sort of Japanese executive, probably from the light bulb division or something, who knows, raised his hand. He had a question. And he uh, said, uh, Mr. Guberson, could you explain to me why you insist on making the bombs? Because if you're not in the movie business, and maybe even if you are in the movie business, you're convinced that there's an answer. You're convinced that you can figure out what a hit is. You're convinced that if you pay enough attention to the audience and you do enough research that you can reverse engineer a hit movie. Um, which, of course, you cannot do. Or, I should say, until very recently, you could not do it. So let me explain to you what that means. Uh, uh, when, you, um, when you have a television show or a movie, uh, it, before it's released, it does something called a focus group, uh, which people in Hollywood believe is very, very scientific. And you sort of get in a room smaller than this, and um, maybe about 18 people, and um, they sit and they watch the picture of the TV show, and they have a little dial in their hand, you know, about, I don't know, about the size of a hockey puck, when he plays hockey, and you watch the thing and you turn it up when you like what you see, and you turn it down when you don't like what you see. And all of those reactions are then graphed on the screen, and so behind a wall or a window, one-way mirror, people like me stand there, and we watch the audience, just like this, watch our show or our movie, and then turn the dials. And we see the dials on. So we know when they're bored, we know when they're interested, we know when they like what they're looking at, we know when they don't like what they're looking at. The Problem is that people normally stop evaluating what they're watching. They're either interested or they're not. So sometimes they'll turn down the dial when they don't like what's happening on the screen, meaning, they don't like the villain. They don't like the fact that the heroine is in trouble. Oh, I don't like that. 
And what executives in Hollywood then do is they come to you later, they say, well, listen, they seem to enjoy the movie or the show, they just don't like that one villain, so can we just get rid of him? Meaning, can we get rid of the entire point of the story? And 30% of the time, people say yes. And then you wonder why the movie doesn't work well. But what that really shows is that nobody, uh, you never know what the audience is gonna want. You never know. The movies and TV shows create a market, or they should. Uh, for instance, I mean, when I was in film school, um, my first year, a big director, uh, no, a big producer came to talk to us. And he came, he was, the, he was the head of then Warner Brothers, a guy named Terry Semmel, and who then went on to run Yahoo and a few other things. But Terry, Terry Semmel's there, and then the biggest agent in town at the time, whose name was Mike Ovitz. These were very powerful people, and they came to talk to us. And they both agreed. They said, um, you're all writers here. There's only one way to be successful, and that's you have to write something that you really want to write. You have to care. You can't just sit in a room and think, oh, what did the studios want to buy? Because that, out, that product will be terrible. The script will be good, will be terrible. You have to think about what it is, who you really are, what you really care about, what story you really want to tell. And then you have to tell that. And Mike Ovitz gave this very passionate plea for the writer writing something from the heart and from the soul, writing a story that he cares about, writing a story that's relevant to him and his life, and only writing that and not worrying at all about the marketplace. And the studio head next to him, Terry Sewell, said, I agree with every word Terry, that, that, that Mike Ovitz has said, but don't write a Western. So you could be doing anything you want, just not a Western. And the reason he said don't write a Western is because as far as he was concerned, they didn't make any money anymore. Nobody wanted to watch a Western. And I think it was less than a year later that two Westerns came out that did very well. One was called Silverado, one was called Young Guns. And then, then there's Silverado 2, obviously, because it was so successful they made two of them. And Young Guns, they made Young Guns 2. Um, and they made another one, um, a remake of Wyatt Earp, a remake of OK, uh, Shoot Out of the OK Corral. So in a period of five years, they made five, people made five westerns that audiences went to go see. Now, had you asked audiences six years before, hey, do you want to see a western, they would have probably said no. But that just shows you that the, a successful picture makes the market. Um, so what we learned is that if you, if, you, if you don't listen to them, if you try not to listen to, the, to research, and you try to make a movie on your own, or try to make an individual in, uh, idiosyncratic, not necessarily independent financially, but uh, unique movie, you have a higher degree of likelihood of being successful. That's what it used to be like. What's happening now, the movie we're gonna see uh, on Monday was uh, released in 62, I think, 62, 63. Um, means it was shot about 61. Uh, and it's set in Berlin before the wall comes up. Very interesting movie, very funny, very funny. Right around then was the, one of the lowest points for Hollywood, people always forget. Hollywood had suffered this enormous collapse starting around the late 50s, all the way in, really almost into the early 70s. It's so almost 15 years of drought in Hollywood, of, of depression. Uh, that was the last time, by the way, in that period that Paramount made fewer than 10 movies. Now it's making 10. Um, that before that was the period of these lavish musicals and big war pictures, um, dramas, big scale dramas, um, where, uh, and where directors were making pictures left and right. And um, the conventional wisdom at the time was, the reason these movies, the reason the box office is dropping, the reason that Hollywood studios are hurting financially is because of television. People are at home uh, watching television. That wasn't really true. The truth is that the movie theaters, the screens, they were all downtown in the middle of cities. So in the United States, anyway. If you wanted to go see a movie, you went into the city to see a movie. That's where the movie theaters were. But in the ensuing years after the war and between the late 50s and the early 70s, people moved out of the cities and they moved to the suburbs where there were no movie theaters. There were no screens. You know, your customer can't buy a ticket to a movie if there are no screens. And people who lived in the suburbs didn't want to come all the way into the city, especially at a time when cities were thought to be dangerous and um, filled with the, the wrong element, and then park your car, and then go see a movie, and then get back in your car and drive home. So the period of 
of drought for Hollywood was a period where the, the, you didn't have the screen in front of the audience to see the movie. So when they started building multiplexes, you can see in the suburbs, you know, these, these are big movie theaters, they have them here, but you know, 27 screens or 30 screens, some of them are enormous. Um, big shopping malls outside of town uh, in the suburbs where they put in all the movie screens. When they started building those, you could see the box office went up when they were closer to the customer. Uh, another way of putting it. So the, the, the real rule is if you want people to look at your, show, your movie or your, your show, you have to get the screen as close to them as possible, which down they have done. There's nothing closer than this. This is now a movie screen and we carry it around. That's a, that's a movie screen. Uh, who has a smartphone? Does everybody have a smartphone? Do you watch video on it? Do you watch movies on it? Well, you're film students, right? So you probably think it's bad, right? <laughs> but eventually, you'll see a movie on it because you carry it around in your pocket. So now film distribution doesn't require you to drive downtown or go to the mall or stand in line or buy a ticket. You just press whatever it is you want to see and there it is. Um, that's, a, that's a huge change in Hollywood. And that alone, this process of people looking at it on iPads and iPhones and smartphones and the, you know, the, 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 um, the Samsung phone, the Galaxy, is bigger, is almost twice as big as this. And they find that Apple has discovered that people choose the Galaxy over the iPhone, not just because of price, but because they like the slightly bigger screen because they like to watch TV on their phone. Um, I mean, this is a film school, so it probably is less, less prevalent here. But in every other class I've ever been in, people or students who have their laptops open, and there's always a screen of something, chat or video or something. You just naturally carry it around. It's where it is. It's what, where, when, when you bring the screen to the audience, when you uh, close to the audience so they can drive, you can still make some money. But when you bring it into their actual pockets, it doesn't, it, it, it starts to break down. And that's really when uh, we begin to see the, the decline, what I, don't, what I actually think is the irreversible decline of Hollywood. In the old days, you could simply bring the screen, build more, more screens. Now it's harder. Because now what we have is we have a phone that has no uh, limit and no ticket price. So now what we have is we have this, this, this device that's connected to the most universal unlimited store width and unlimited bandwidth in our universe. And so you not only have more choices, but you have free choices. Uh, I, was gonna, I was gonna read some of these out. Um, Pirate Bay? No one's responding. Uh, Torrent? Who, who, who torrents here? Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Only, only one? Well, only, we have only one honest, okay, two. Yeah, it's all, all that. That's it? Three? <laughs> so uh, the, only thing we're, the only thing we're admitting to today is that we, we are familiar with it. Well, a torrenting for everyone who's over 900. <laughs> uh, a torrent site like Pirate Bay or um, this, what's the one in Australia? I forget the name of the one in Australia. Um, and no one's, notice no one's pretending they know. A torrent site is a site that, can, can, that takes media, uh, free usually, people s steal it. Yeah. It's a form of copyright theft. Yeah. And, um, and then sends it out and allows peer-to-peer -peer kind of computing, peer-to-peer -peer matching, where you can torrent a movie and torrent a TV show, torrent a whole series without having to pay for it. <coughs> without having to watch it on, on, uh, on commercial television or paying for the DVD. Um, people in Hollywood are obsessed with torrenting, um, on, uh, directly proportional to their age. Uh, older people are terrified of it and think it's the end. And younger directors, younger people think, oh, what are you going to do? The outcome of torrenting really has been that most studios will now put money into big, 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 big movies that you really don't want to watch on an iPad or an iPhone with the enormous effects, computer graphics, all that stuff. And then they release them simultaneously around the world, or very close to simultaneously. It's called day and date, and people are very specific about that. Day and date, for instance, for the Spider-Man movie um, was big because it opened in China, I think, within 24 hours. 
And it used to be that a big picture uh, in the United States, any one of those big superhero movies, uh, really within 36 hours, you could buy it on the streets in Shanghai as a DVD. People would go to the movie theater and they would kind of, and they'd take the hearing, so for deaf people, the sort of hearing impaired audio, and they'd plug it in and they'd sync it up at home and they would bit torrent it. They would do this as a, as a, free, as a free service. Um, has anybody torrented a movie? Yeah. Yeah. No. Doors closed. Nobody's gonna, <laughs> nobody get, nobody's gonna get in trouble for that. Um, I, in, my, in my opinion, I, I'm not sure it's the biggest problem that we have. Uh, and I, if, it, if it is a big problem, um, it's unsolvable. So like all problems that are unsolvable, I choose to ignore it. Um, but I'll tell you, this is the business that I joined in 1990. Um, you had five big studios, six big studios. They made every picture pretty much that appeared. Uh, you had upstart financiers who were extremely entrepreneurial, like the Weinsteins at Miramax and others, who uh, managed to make movies, uh, prestige movies for uh, a good price, and then they had a formula. For a while, if you were making a movie that was produced by Harvey Weinstein, it had to have a wedding at the end. And that was his rule. Put a wedding at the end. Uh, and it made him a very rich man. Uh, he made some very, very good movies. Uh, he didn't have to answer to any studio head. But the studios were thriving. In the world of television, there were, when I started, there were four big American television networks. Well, three and a half, because the, the emerging Fox network um, the, 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 not the news channel, but the scripted channel. Um, that was just starting to sort of get a toehold. ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. Um, and they split up the audience every night. <coughs> it was really like a, a form of, um, well, not really oligopoly or duopoly, not a triopoly, one of those. Mon Monosomony, or there's a word for it. Mono monopsony, monopsony, meaning four dudes in a room decided what to put on. My show, Cheers, which I don't know, did you see that here? Was it here? All right. Set in a bar. It's a comedy, set in a bar. Uh, it was on Thursday nights at 9 o'clock on NBC. So in a gentleman's agreement, the other networks didn't put on a comedy on Thursday night at 9 o'clock. The theory being, why should we make people who want to watch a comedy choose which comedy they want to watch? Instead, why don't we put on a, if you were CBS, you put on a cop show. You put on a, a crime drama. And if you were ABC, you thought, well, yeah, those two things are really popular. Let's put on something cheap to produce. So they put on a one-hour uh, news show. Um, and everybody was happy. Uh, we would, I would come into the office uh, on a Friday morning and they would have written on a board, we had a big board, they would have written on it um, our rating and our share the night before, meaning how many millions of people watched us and what percentage of the total audience we had. It was a very successful show, so we would always come in, it would always be sort of 30, so 32 million people, and then maybe 30%, 30 share, 33% of the people watching, which is enormous, that's an enormous number. And um, nothing gets that number anymore. Nothing gets that number uh, in television. And um, well, think of it this way, 30 million people, if 30 million people watch, sit for half an hour and watch your show, it's like 30 million people going to a movie. 30 million going, people going to a movie in the United States is a $400 million movie in one weekend, two weekends. If a movie achieves a certain trajectory in the box office, you can bet it's going to make another twice that. So to, to move 30 million people to do something on a day or time that you've specified, because remember, back then, you had no choice, uh, was an enormous thing to do, an enormous thing to do. Uh, and people in network television did it regularly. People in the movie business did it regularly. And that's a very interesting thing, um, because it's, it's hard now if you're, uh, so half the people here are under 25, right? 20. Um, it's an enormous change to think about what media means now. 
If you're a young person, not even that young, I think if you're even if you're 30, you've lived in a world in which you choose what to watch when you watch it. If you want to watch something and anyone's giving you trouble, if there's a paywall or your iTunes doesn't work or you don't want to pay, you can BitTorrent it and be watching it in 10 seconds. Uh, you, the, the generation that we grew up in, people who are older grew up in, was we had to wait and look in a newspaper and, and find out when they were going to allow us to pay money to go watch the movie or see the TV show. And if we missed it, we were out of luck. We had to wait six months or a year to see that one episode again. People planned their schedules around what time they were going to sit and watch television. Not because they were going to do it with anybody else, but because they knew if they missed it, they were going to miss it. Big American movies, classic American movies, when they were scheduled to be on television, The Wizard of Oz, for instance, was a yearly event. It was a big deal. The Wizard of Oz is going to be on television on Sunday night at 7. People would stay in. Now, if that seems astonishingly pushy. I mean, it's almost, sometimes when I talk to young people about the way it was and the way, and copyright issues like BitTorrent, they get angry, like, how dare anyone, how could you live in a world so totalitarian that it would tell you when you had to watch a TV show? That seemed ins like insane, but we did it all the time, and we, and, uh, we never thought a thing about it. So, and, and that, I, I, ultimately, is the big difference. Um, that, to me, there are so many ways of describing a golden age in, in Hollywood, but as somebody who works there now, um, I like to think of the golden age as the age in which they paid me the most money for the least amount of work. And that was right then. Because you had this explosion of interest in media. You had this, uh, 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 this explosion of the, uh, the sense of what it was going to become, how valuable a film library could be, how valuable a television library could be. But you didn't have any competition, really. There was no competition out there. There was before the internet, it was before unlimited bandwidth and unlimited store width, it was before all of those things. And so it was all just this rosy horizon. And as far as you could see, they would be paying you millions of dollars to sit on, in, a, in a fancy office and stare at the ceiling and think, oh, maybe I'll do a show about that. Uh, because that was the kind of hunger they had. So when I talk about the end of Hollywood, I'm not asking for any sympathy. I'm just asking, I'm just sort of setting the table so you understand. Um, <clears throat> after 9-11, so after September 11th, um, uh, a couple of the Bush administration officials came to Hollywood for a meeting um, to talk about um, how Hollywood could help. Now Hollywood has a very, 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 very positive uh, image of itself. We like ourselves very, very much. I mean, do you watch the Oscars? I mean, you would think that all of those people in that theater had cured some disease or had saved an orphanage or something. The way they talk about how the fact that they allowed themselves to be paid millions of dollars to pretend to be someone else. It's staggering. Um, and believe me, if and when I win an Oscar, I will be just as horrible. I will be absolutely, I will act as if I, you know, I have the new cancer cure. Um, so when the, when the Bush administration came, it was a big meeting, and some of us were there, and um, there was a long preamble where everybody, all the pompous people in Hollywood, um, were talking about what they, what they were going to do. That obviously there's a problem with the American image abroad. We need to, we are the, this powerful indus, industrial uh, organization. We're a cultural institution, I think John said. We're very powerful. Everybody watches Hollywood movies. Everyone around the world, um, we have to do something about our movies. And uh, I think the Bush people sort of shrugged and said, yeah, yeah, yeah. What they really wanted was they wanted early releases. I think they knew they were going to war. They wanted agreement from Hollywood Studios to give uh, the Defense Department early versions of every picture so they could put them on aircraft carriers and show them to the troops abroad. Very simple request, really. But what Hollywood wanted to do was to do bigger American, you know, think movies. Um, because Hollywood still thinks that people watch Hollywood movies. I mean, the number one box office act, do you know who the biggest actor in the world is? Biggest actor. It's not Brad Pitt. 
It's uh, Shah Rukh Khan. He's a Bollywood star. And the biggest actress is a Bollywood actress whose name I will not even mention because it's too, I'll get it wrong. Uh, the biggest movie business in the world is in India. They make uh, hundreds of pictures a year. I think it was four years ago, the top budget for a Bollywood picture was $15 million, which is a lot of money to spend on a movie. But actually in Hollywood now, uh, if you try, to sell, you try to make a movie for $15 million, people say, don't, don't bother. It's not enough to matter. It's not enough that we could put money into selling it. So if you could, we can make a movie for $2 million, and we can make a movie for $25 or $30 million. But in between, that's a danger zone. But Bollywood turns out movies. Anybody seen Bollywood pictures? You, have you torn to them? No. <laughs> Did you like them? Uh, it's not my thing, but it's interesting. They're huge. They're three hours. They're a little bit of everything. This is a genre. It's a, it's, it's a caper movie and a buddy picture and a romance. And usually there's some occult thing in there too, and a thriller, and then a crime drama, and a, and a, and a musical. And it's all in one big thing. Uh, and they are, if you're interested in film, and you're interested in movies, and spectacle, and what movies can really be, um, they are fascinating. But they are the number one movie business in the world. It's not Hollywood, it's not Brad Pitt, it's not Matt Damon, it's not, uh, uh, um, um, you know, James Cameron. I mean, it is James Cameron, but it's, he's alone. It's, uh, it's Bollywood. And, um, and there's a couple reasons for that. One is that, Bali, that India has the world's most populous democracy. And the second is that there are a lot of screens in India. Still screens, movie theaters, big old ones that they've multiplexed out. And there's fewer of this. We have more screens, but they have more movie screens. And that's a big, big, big difference. Um, and that, again, will not change. <coughs> that is just what it, 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 it will always be. The model to look at, if you're interested in films and you're interested in media, is, is the music business. Um, is anybody here a musician in a band? Oh, so the, too busy torrenting, I think. Um, the music business had a gigantic collapse about 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And everyone said it was because of piracy. It was because of, uh, well, the, mu the music version of, of Pirate Bay and torrenting. Um, there was one called LimeWire, and then well, the famous one was um, Napster. Napster. Oh, yeah, the, the pirate in the back knows. Uh, and everyone said, oh, it's, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the music, every music executive you've ever talked to said, this is our biggest problem. Uh, the music business is over um, because of this. Um, but it is, wasn't because of that. When you have unlimited bandwidth, right, connected to unlimited store width, which is equally important, you can save everything. Everything is equivalent. Everything's on the same level. In the old days, music, in the old days, you could even, some of you can maybe remember that. In the old days, music, um, you, you got a CD. And, and if you were lucky, you had a CD changer. And so you put 10 of them in there, or five of them, put a bunch of them, right? And you put it on random, and then if you got, you go get more music, and you put it in the thing, in the rotation, and you just listen to the mu no more music, and then you get more music, and that was what got you off your ass to go and change, was you had more music. And then the CDs would go on shelves, and they'd just stay there. And you'd never touch them again. Your new music only competed for your attention with new music. Never with old music. Old music was old. And so people had these vast CD libraries. I mean, Ikea, I think. Ikea, it's interesting, old Ikea catalogs. You know, the, 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 the furniture place, uh, Ikea. They would have, they had a, a wide selection of CD racks, ways to store your CDs. That's insane, right? Now, if you're under 25, that just seems bananas because you have Spotify, or you have it all on iTunes, or you're lime wiring or you're Napstering, or whatever it is you're doing, right? Your music competes with itself. Your collection competes with itself. You can e just as easily listen to old music as new music. You don't have to get up. You don't have to find it. You don't have to put it on the turntable. It competes equivalently. That is, was a radical change in human behavior, a radical change in behavior. Because the old days, you had, we, relate, we relied on your laziness. In television, we relied on your laziness not to change the channel. 
even when you had a remote control, people would not change the channel because that's over there. I'll just watch this. It's remarkable how much money, how much of an entire business was built on making things easy for the customer but not too easy. So easier for you to go see a movie but not so easy that you can watch it on your phone. Easy for you to get music but not so easy that you have to, you'll cross the room and put it on the turntable. So your new music purchases were higher and they collapsed when people had these. Because people began to listen. I mean, everybody's had that experience, right? Where you put your collection on shuffle and you hear music, you're like, oh, God, I forgot that I even owned that. And then if, now, if you pay for Spotify, you pay for Spotify? I think there's a copyright issue with Spotify. Is there a copy here in, in Hungary? Can we get Spotify? Yeah. But if you, if you pay for it, um, you have access to everything. It doesn't matter. You can listen to as much music as you want. You have access to everything. And so that's why Hollywood is over. Because the customer has more power. Um, I have a friend who grew up in, um, in uh, Ohio. And um, his, he had two brothers, four brothers, four brothers. Uh, and two of them decided to um, go into business making this, um, I don't know how to describe it. So it's like a pickled bean, pickled beans. A bean, they call it a bean salad, but it's pickled beans. So you take a bunch of beans, like, like uh, string beans, like uh, arico vera, you know, and you put them in, uh, and, and hard beans, you know, like white beans. You put them in a jar, and you stick vinegar in it, and you close up the top, you stick a label on it, and you sell it. It's actually, it's actually very good. Uh, and they came up with some name that's vaguely fraudulent for it, like, you know, Sunny Brook. Uh, farms, but there's no farm involved, it's a giant machine. And they, make the, they made this thing for a couple of years, and, um, and they did very well. Uh, and then it was popular enough that Walmart came. And you don't have Walmart here? Walmart? Walmart is a gigantic American retailer. It's the largest uh, retail chain in the world. Um, and they are famous for low price on everything and for squeezing out all of the margin, the price margin, in an item to deliver the lowest price to the customer. So Walmart came to these brothers and said, and they're giant. So when Walmart comes and says, we want your product, um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's almost like somebody's come and given you millions of dollars. You, 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 you're successful. Except Walmart calculates. They said, we've calculated the price. What it costs you to dump all that crap in the jar and fill it with vinegar and put the top on the label. And we figure it costs you somewhere between five and six cents per jar to make. So we're going to pay you 6.2 cents per jar. And you will make 0.2 cent profit on your jar. Um, take it or leave it. If you take it, we want a million jars every 20 minutes. And if you don't take it, we're going to find somebody else to make exactly this. Uh, so the brothers took it, um, and the only way they make money is they have to make a b billion jars every 20 minutes, which they do. But Walmart squeezed out all of the fat. It, just, it was an incredibly smart, ruthless business that naturally took the margin out. And that is what the internet does to Hollywood. The web itself empowers all the customers to squeeze out the fat. If you, anybody been to Los Angeles? All right, well, you drive around, yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. You drive around LA, there's all these big houses, and these rich neighborhoods, these fancy cars, and everybody is not an actor, or a writer, or a producer, or studio chief. Who are all these rich people? And they're all rich, they're, they are agents, and lawyers, and, and uh, managers. They're people who make their money on the margin on the fact that a movie is going to cost $100 million, no one's going to miss the $2 million they have to pay me to get the business done. Well, <coughs> that's going away. Uh, the margin's coming down, and so there are fewer of those people scooping up the big fat fees. And when that happens, everything's going to get very serious, and everything is going to, and it's happening now in the film business, everything's going to get very, 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 very businesslike. The good news for people who are starting in the businesses, that that un un unleashes enormous opportunity for you. 
the uh, opportunities of geography and proximity, the fact that you have to be in Hollywood, all those things are gone. The fact that your television show has to look like a television show on a television network, all of those things are gone. Um, the, the marketplace is now a little chaotic. It's hard to manage. It's um, a terrible place to make one picture and make a billion dollars, but it's a very good place to do interesting work if that's what you want to do. If what you want is to make a giant blockbuster, um, well, you'll have, to, you'll have to submit your business to the Walmartization right, of the web and, uh, and hope, that you, hope that you make it. Um, so, I don't want to go too, too much longer, I, uh, but I, there's, a, there's a, um, a tendency for people, probably we're all the same, who are in the film business or the, or the show or Hollywood, to think that things are changing. Well, technically, it's true, things are changing. Um, but it seems like a strange thing when you really think about it in human history. That we told, for a hundred years, we told people that the thing they're supposed to do in their leisure hour was uh, sit. When, when we told them to sit, remember, we told them what time to sit. And to watch in the dark something on the screen. Or that they were supposed to sit on a sofa at night with their family, silently watching a screen. I mean, that seems crazy really, when you think about it. How do we convince people to do that? I mean, this whole city was built on sort of the, the cultural, artistic and cultural part of it, a kind of a group culture, a group art. Um, people in the old days, they went to the theater and they heard the symphonies and things. They did that uh, not, not on a regular basis or not frequently unless they were rich. But what did you do in your free hours for a thousand years before somebody put up a movie screen. You sat around and you wrote letters. You made idle chit chat with your friends, gossip and that stuff. You played games. You shared music in the sense of like playing music for each other. Um, or sometimes you just sort of sat together and did nothing. And you look at what people do now on these phones, well, they, they play games with each other. On computers, they play MSN, Xbox, they play with people across the world. They um, listen to music, they share music on Spotify, back and forth, or pirated, or peer-to-peer. -peer. They idle chit-chat. What's more idle and more chit-chatty than Facebook or Twitter? And they send letters, emails, back and forth. Although email is really something only old people do. Young people don't do that. They text. And that's what you do. Because the one thing they're not making any more of, I mean, they're making more channels on television, and they're making more movie screens, and they're making more uh, <coughs> movies around the world. Uh, they're making more television shows in the United States. There's 90 channels, 47 channels this year producing scripted entertainment. Not reality or news, but scripted. They're making all sorts of more of those things. The one thing they're not making is more time, more hours in the day. They're not making any more minutes. That's, that's you decided how many minutes you got, and you got it. And so if you spend two hours a day uh, texting, or two hours a day on Facebook or Twitter, or listening to music, or doing something really easy on the phone that connects you to somebody else, that's two hours that I don't have, or Hollywood doesn't have, to sell you a movie or a TV show. And so maybe when you look at human behavior now, what we, what we do with our, with our machines now, Maybe it isn't a change. Maybe we're not changing. Maybe we're changing back. We're just changing back to a different medium, but essentially the same activity that people for a thousand years did, which is very good news, I think, for the human race, but not so great news for people in Hollywood, which may or may not be the same group. Uh, so, I urge you to think, uh, 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 in whatever you're going to do now in movies or television or, or, or media, <clears throat> to think about the new, what I would call the new Hollywood or the new entertainment successes. Uh, 
It's not Daryl Zanuck or Louis B. Mayer or um, Lou Wasserman or Hal Roach or any of the great names from the past. It's uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the, the guy who owns Facebook. It's the guys who created WhatsApp, that app, that chat app. It's, the, it's uh, Jack Dorsey and Evan Williams who created uh, Twitter. It's the guy who invented uh, Airbnb. Do you have Airbnb here? You know, the, it's a you know, couch surfing so you can go stay with somebody. Um, I actually worked out a list of them. Yelp, yeah, Foursquare, Snap, Snapchat. You have Snapchat here? Snapchat, WhatsApp, Facebook, Facebook Twitter. These are all apps on your phone, so the old people have to explain it. <laughs> WhatsApp is a chat. It's a chat app, so you can text back and forth, but it's faster than texting. Uh, Facebook bought it for $16 billion, or 19, depending on how you do the, the Twitter. Twitter is for microblogging. Um, which one? Tumblr. What's that? Tumblr. Oh, Tumblr. Right, Tumblr. Right, or Tumblr. Ah. Tumblr, perfect example. That's really the new entertainment. And it's something you create for yourself. And it's something you create with your friends and you create for the public at large. And that's closer to who we really have always been than sitting in the dark and watching a screen. Because the truth is that um, it, the, the fundamental human need for media is to fight a war against loneliness. I'm by myself, I don't wanna be, I go see a movie or I watch TV. But if you can fight that war with a better weapon, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, WhatsApp, any of those. Oh, yeah. You are in a much better business position. And so what I would say to you is if well, you're, whatever your media products are in the future, whatever you create in the future, whatever kind of creative thing you do, try and see if you can adjust it or rethink it so it, it touches that part. Because that's what people, that's where the screens are. And that's what I would say to you, is that you now, more than anyone in Hollywood, more than anyone in the offices, more than anyone in those towers, you know where the screens are. They don't. And whoever knows where the screens are, that, that's the person who wins. Thank you very much. That was very, 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 but very tender. But I, I, <laughs>